Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I must thank uh, Ned first uh, because um, I was wondering when I was preparing the talk how much of a detail and um, specific example I should get into or not. And I decided not to, hoping that he would get into some. And he did. So thanks, Ned. Um, my talk, I will uh, spend just a few minutes on the background and um, not um, you know, discuss many of the things that Ned has already mentioned, but hopefully move the conversation into um, what, what is ARP doing and what are the needs uh, and the barriers that we are facing right now that need to be overcome. Uh, so the background is uh, the first uh, context we have um, numerous reports, whether from the EGAP, uh, the US Preventive Services Task Force, uh, from the NIH State of the Science Conferences, um, and many other guideline developers and systematic reviews. There are large gaps in our knowledge of the impact of therapeutics, and especially in diagnostics, on patient outcomes in real world clinical practice. And this is not just for rare diseases, although this is more so for rare disease, uh, it's even in common diseases. Um, so that's one challenge that we face right now. The second, which Ned had mentioned as marginal benefit, is this issue, uh, and especially for common diseases, we don't lack treatments, we don't lack diagnostic tests. There are plenty, whether it's for treating high blood pressure, uh, for lowering your cholesterol, or for treating osteoporosis. We don't have a shortage of uh, drugs. What we need to know for anything new is what is the added value of this new thing, new technology, new drug, new test. And everyone who needs this information has to be sure the information is valid and credible on what the benefits are and what the harms are, regardless of what the context of making the decision is, whether it's the clinician having a patient walk into the clinic, whether it's a guideline developer, whether it's a payer who wants to make a coverage decision or a federal agency that wants to make a regulatory decision. There may be some other aspects beyond benefits and harms to consider, but this is certainly the critical element. Another issue that we face, and you know, there are numerous examples of this, is that for many diseases, even in common diseases, the natural history and the pathogenesis of the disease are often incompletely understood. So this is an issue when you decide, uh, are we studying surrogate markers? Are these actually surrogate markers or not? And if they are, if you're seeing an improvement in a surrogate marker, will that translate to a benefit in the health outcome or not? And we've had numerous examples when that hasn't panned out uh, to be true. So even say a common disease like osteoporosis, Sodium fluoride sure increases bone mineral density. It doesn't decrease uh, fracture risk, and that's really what the patient cares about, not that their bones are dense, but that you actually have fractures. Um, same is true for screening for prostate cancer, hepatitis C. There are so many examples when the natural history of the disease and the unknowns limit the ability of a guideline developer to say clearly there are more benefits than harms. So what are the reasons we are facing this? Uh, and I'll put two points across. One, I think, is uh, there are limitations in our existing infrastructure capabilities. Uh, so the electronic databases that we have, they don't talk to each other. The information is siloed. Often it's not the right kind of information. And so we have problems that need to be overcome from the infrastructure point of view. It's also partly due with the study methods, whether it's observational studies or randomized controlled trials. Depending on the question being asked, there are often issues that can lead to bias and confounding that affect the validity of the results. So you want the results to be valid and generalizable. And the last point, of course, you know, for several reasons we can have a long discussion on this, the goals of biomedical researchers are not typically aligned with those of clinical providers. So with this context, you know, one of the challenges that we are facing is can we improve our healthcare delivery infrastructure so that we can use it for research, we can use it for improving quality of care, and for new information like genetic tests. <clears throat> now, the other thing that had briefly been mentioned is comparative effectiveness research. I won't go into the definition in detail. This is the one that the Federal Coordinating Council came up with. I'll just highlight three things in here that I think are important. One is that in comparative effectiveness, you are looking at the benefits and harms of different interventions. 
So it's not a placebo, it's not doing nothing. It's actually comparing different alternative interventions, whether it's diagnostics or therapeutics, in a real world setting, which is important. It's not in an artificial, highly selected patient population, highly selected clinical settings where you don't know if you can generalize the results. It's actually real world practice. And the last part of the definition, which I think is important, is we are doing this to improve health outcomes, not the surrogate markers, not for creating new knowledge, but to actually improve the quality of life or the care of the patient. <clears throat> so uh, what ARC has done in the past several years, and this started with the Medicare Modernization Act, was to create a new program called Effective Healthcare, uh, which focused on uh, comparative effectiveness. And the four goals of this program are to create new knowledge, to review and synthesize existing knowledge, <clears throat> and that actually has been something we have been doing for a long time. Uh, the evidence-based practice center reviews that Ned mentioned are part of what we use for reviewing and synthesizing the existing knowledge. Then the two other components are to translate and disseminate the findings, uh, including tools such as clinical decision support tools, decision aids, and to train and build the capacity in this field, which is still new. Uh, so I have only one slide on genomics projects, but this is to tell you that ARC has not been inactive in this field. Uh, so I mentioned the evidence-based practice centers or the EPC reports, which have uh, helped uh, many different guideline developers, EGAP, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, the NIH State of the Science Conferences uh, on Family History, uh, CMS uh, and their MedCAC process, uh, CDC, and of course topics that get nominated by clinical societies. Uh, we have also uh, done work in creating new knowledge. We funded a randomized control trial, this was the Marsh Field Clinic, on looking at warfarin ba gene based dosing calculator and comparing that to a clinical dosing calculator alone. That was published in Genetics and Medicine. And there are two add-on uh, genomic projects in uh, prospect studies, and I'll tell you in more detail what the prospect stands for. We also created a new computer-based clinical decision support tool for assessing a BRCA mutation risk in the primary care setting. And this was done because the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force had made a recommendation uh, for the primary care that when there are women who are at a higher risk, they should be referred for appropriate counseling and testing. The challenge is um, the primary care clinician does not have the time, and sometimes some can argue the skills, to actually get detailed cancer family history to know what the BRCA risk of the woman is. So uh, we created a tool for that. And uh, it's not live because um, we spent more time creating the tool. We thought there was much more knowledge about what to do in primary care. It turns out there wasn't. So we spent most of our resources in creating the tool, not so much on validating the tool. And so we actually have a collaboration with the CDC to do bigger studies uh, and get a sense of how well this tool performs in the real world. <clears throat> then we also had uh, two, uh, I guess, conceptual reports, I would call them. One was done in collaboration with the CDC to uh, look at the existing infrastructure in the U.S. and to ascertain how well can we use the infrastructure to look at utilization of genetic tests or the outcomes of genetic tests. And another one which we recently released uh, a few months ago was looking at the analytic validity, uh, quality rating, and evaluation frameworks. So this was a report to build on the work that EGAP has done, the Preventive Services Task Force has done, the CDC has done with the ACCE framework, and an older uh, Thornbury Fryback Fry framework on evaluating diagnostic tests. So this report essentially looked at the different clinical con contexts in which, or scenarios, when you would use a genetic test, uh, who the audience is, who the user is, and then what are the most uh, important questions that uh, are, should be addressed in an evidence review. So our work on creating new infrastructure, uh, we started uh, two pilot projects back in 2007 on uh, distributed research networks. Uh, so for those who are not familiar with distributed research, the, the traditional model of research is all the participating sites, organizations send their database into one large centralized database which then there are some issues about both the quality of the data as well as privacy and confidentiality of the information available in the data. So people are always nervous in giving their data 
to an unknown centralized entity that can use it anytime in the future. One way around this is can we actually do distributed research where the data or the databases actually reside in different clinical organizations. They are partnering only as, on an as needed project to uh, distribute the information, selected information, so that you're not sharing all the information in one repository. And this would allow you the ability to connect different electronic medical records, to connect different databases, and overcome some of the privacy and confidentiality concerns. <clears throat> so we had two different projects that we funded. One was to create a new, uh, this was a DartNet project. Uh, this is at the University of Colorado. They had linked six different EMRs in the first go around, linked the EMRs with uh, claims database, pharmacy databases, clinical lab databases, uh, and showed that it can actually be done, and that you can also collect patient reported outcomes uh, using this linkage <clears throat> uh, to improve the quality of care and use it for comparative effectiveness research. The other was to enhance an existing uh, collaboration, the HMO Research Network, which was, uh, with, they've already spent many years building the virtual data warehouse. The challenge is can you actually get virtual data warehouses from the different organizations to talk to each other and generate the information. <clears throat> so we published that, uh, this was done in, uh, two years ago in Annals of Internal Medicine, and we learned both from the successes and the challenges in these projects uh, so that our goal was to build on this and build new uh, systems that are multi-purpose, so not just for research, but also for quality improvement, for disease surveillance, clinical decision support. These are dynamic, so it's not just one data entry static, you can't do anything with that, but you can go back and change, add new fields, change the data as needed. These need to be electronic, so they are based on EMRs uh, or EHRs uh, from the get-go, and they can collect prospective uh, data. And this spanned several of the ARC portfolios. Just to tell you that this uh, has widespread interest at ARC, and also this is a new multidisciplinary effort. So uh, our good fortune in getting uh, the ARA uh, funding, which was, for those of you who haven't followed it, $1.1 billion for comparative effectiveness research. Out of this, about $100 million, uh, were spent in building these new uh, systems. So I had mentioned Prospect earlier. So this is one of the RFAs I had uh, taken the lead in writing on uh, prospective outcome systems uh, that used patient-specific electronic data to compare tests and therapies. Uh, we awarded six RO1s from these. Uh, then uh, we also came up with two other uh, RFAs. Uh, and because of the time crunch, I didn't have enough time to think of creative new acronyms. So these are just as is. Uh, one was uh, Scalable Distributed Research Networks. We funded three R01s here. And the third one is the enhanced registries that can be used both for quality improvement and for comparative effectiveness research. The fourth RFA was, you know, it's well and good to do the research. Can you actually bring the lessons learned in a convening forum so that you can advance the national dialogue in analytic methods, in clinical informatics, uh, and uh, in the data governance issues. So we um, awarded to Academy Health uh, a cooperative agreement on creating a new electronic data methods forum. So the common themes across these R01 projects, <coughs> the requirements were they had to be able to link multiple healthcare delivery sites. So in this case, it would be inpatient care, outpatient care, specialty clinics, uh, nursing home, long-term care. So these had to be different care delivery sites. It's not just linking two clinics in one academic center and saying this is enough. Uh, they needed to connect multiple databases, uh, be it different electronic health records, uh, be it linking with claims databases, pharmacy databases. They needed to focus on priority populations and conditions. So the concern about underserved populations, generalizability of the results, those were to be addressed. They needed to demonstrate they can collect prospective patient-centered outcomes to use it for comparative effectiveness research so that you can ultimately get valid and generalizable conclusions. Another uh, theme that we stressed was there was a focus on governance and stakeholder engagement. Uh, and this was all in an effort to make it sustainable. We knew the ARA funding was a one-time large bolus, but if the projects do things that 
are valuable to different stakeholders, be it patients, providers, payers, clinical guideline developers, professional societies, then the hope is once the initial investment is done, there will be support to sustain this beyond the three-year timeline of these projects. <clears throat> Now, the other um, special features of the registry and distributed projects, for the registry, the requirement was to build on an existing registry because the three-year timeline did not allow us to start a new registry and then to show they can use it for comparative effectiveness research. Another requirement was to do comparative effectiveness research and quality improvement. So you heard some of the challenges about the tensions in research and clinical practice. Well, the same happens in people who do quality improvement and who do research. Generally, quality improvement folks don't have to worry about an IRB, but on the other hand, they're not looking to publish findings to get grant funding. So they do live in different worlds, and can you actually bring those two worlds together when you're building the registry and make it sustainable and therefore hopefully scalable? The other uh, R01, uh, other RFA focused on uh, distributed research networks where the emphasis was, emphasis was to build on multiple cohorts. So we had asked for at least four different cohorts of at least two different unrelated conditions. So this is sort of a contrast to registries where registries can of, often be disease specific or patient population specific. Um, but, <laughs> all right, I guess I don't want to buy this now. <laughs> um, there's nothing confidential here, so there's no reason for security on this slide. Um, and the other challenge, as you, as you heard, is it's one thing doing research. It's another thing trying to use the information in real-life clinical practice. So you, you need to have data that you can get soon. You can't wait for a few years and then say, okay, now what do I do with my patient? So one of the challenges with these distributed research network projects was can you get near real-time data collection and analysis, and of course, like the registries, make them sustainable and scalable. So I'll just spend a couple of minutes on what I hope is something that you can engage with, uh, the EDM forum. So this is a central repository uh, and resource for information on collecting prospective electronic clinical data that is being done in all of these projects. Uh, there's a website, and I'll have that at the end, that you can access as you want. The purpose is for them to collect uh, and synthesize the lessons learned across all of these 11 projects, to engage the different stakeholders in the science, but also to learn from them uh, what their needs and challenges are, and to build the resources and tools to advance the science in this field. The activities of this forum are on analytic methods, Clinical informatics, as I mentioned, data governance, which includes security, privacy, and privacy and access of information. And there's a new subcommittee on the learning healthcare system, which talks about what I would call non-research issues. Um, this is quality improvement, clinical decision support, and meaningful engagement. So this is the organizational chart. I'll just leave this as my last slide. Uh, there's a the PI of this is Aaron Holvey at Academy Health. There's a steering committee. And Ned Collange, who you have here, uh, <clears throat> he's the chair of that. There are uh, 11 projects uh, and investigators in, uh, that are part of the forum. And I'll stop there. Thank you. We can take uh, one or two comments or questions. Bruce. Could you help me to understand how the mission and scope of work of ARC overlap with and or is distinct from the evolving scope and mission for PCORI? Certainly. Well, ARC, of course, predates PCORI for the longest time. Um, the um, ARC's mission has been the effectiveness, safety, uh, efficiency, um, and quality of healthcare. From our understanding, and PCORI is still evolving, it's focused primarily on patient-centered outcomes. So what happens about issues that are not directly relevant to patient-centered outcomes it's not clear if PCORI is going to be taking those on or not. Um, there is certainly collaboration between the two. Uh, PCORI has um, funded ARC activities or will be funding ARC activities on uh, dissemination, on, on training. Uh, so there will be some amount of collaboration. 
But down the road, what is it that Pakori will actually do hasn't yet been clarified. That I think, from what I heard last time, we will know more about that in January, uh, about their specific topic areas uh, and projects and the mechanisms of funding for those. I have a methodology for the and this, please. Sure. Uh, so I'm going to speak both as a member of the methodology committee and also having been very involved with stakeholders who work to put, uh, you know, to, to support PCORI back when it was called the Comparative Effectiveness Entity, um, then it's through, uh, through, through the blues. Um, and I think the intent is that the vision of the core patient-centered outcomes research incorporates comparative effectiveness, but it is uh, larger and will incorporate uh, uh, new kinds of information that will add to it, so it includes that agenda, it goes beyond it. What the priorities in the agenda is, will be is still being worked out by the core. The, the rules of the road for that are still being set. Methodology committee has a pretty strict uh, task, which is to get a comparative effectiveness guidelines report, methods report, uh, delivered in May. I think there has always been the intent, at least on the part of the stakeholders who are funding the core, it is largely funded through payer funds, some through government funds, that this should amplify what ARC is able to do and not replace what ARC is able to do. I think there is a high appreciation that uh, what we often need is new primary evidence. So many systematic reviews and other efforts end with the conclusion that we really don't have the primary evidence. And so this was seen <coughs> as a vehicle to start to fund that primary evidence. There really are not entities that exist now that have that as their mission or their interest. Sponsors that are going for registration are interested in their product, not comparison. The NIH, I think, is more infused with the spirit of comparative effectiveness, but uh, has not really been uh, seen that as its mission. And this really is uh, sort of the one place that this important social uh, uh, objective can be lodged and is now enhanced with a broader vision of patient-centeredness, so. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, just the, the, the big devil in comparative effectiveness research is, is channeling, or, or put more simply, new drugs are given to slightly sicker people. And I wondered with your methodological research how you were getting on with that particular issue. So uh, the, uh, I mean, so in the U.S., uh, you, there is the FDA labeling that tells you what the drug, or the clinical scenarios of what it can be used and not used for. But there's also what we call off-label use. And the comparative effectiveness research doesn't limit itself to only FDA-approved indications. So any published, so the main uh, issue for comparative effectiveness research is do you actually have the evidence, not on what it was originally approved for, what it's being used for now. So if Things have changed over time, and that change has been captured in publications, then that forms the basis of comparative effectiveness research. But to how well this is characterized, I mean, that's going to be the challenge is to make sure uh, many of the databases that we have, or for example, when you when are doing observational studies, uh, they don't capture the severity of the disease, uh, the test results. So it's very hard to know what patient what type of a patients were given these medications and are they comparable? And so those are all challenges that I think once we get more clinical details in the databases and can link them, hopefully we can address some of those issues. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now have 